Hey internet, welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. And on this week's Ask the Pastor, a requested video review about what is the church and why is someone who's not in agreement with us on what is the church invited to speak at one of our LCMS official universities. <gasps> hmm. Stick around. Uh -oh, uh -oh. Email. All right, so if you haven't seen it yet, WeTV is releasing some new content. We got grappling and we got lightning cuts coming your way. These are going to be regular shows produced by WeTV on the channel and at the new Worldview Everlasting Facebook page, which if you haven't liked it yet, please go do it. We're kind of leaving behind about 2,500 likes at this point, leaving the old broken page. And so, of course, it's always nice to try to get those back. But we've been promising for a while the Lutheran Ninja Clan, five bucks a month, helps make not only this show possible, but is aimed at producing more solid Christian free content for you on the internet in YouTube video style. And that's exactly what is at last happening. Our plans and goals are not to stop here, but to continue to reinvent, redefine, and make better content for you for sharing, for teaching, and all that. And this is just the start. With that said, Worldview Everlasting itself as a show is probably going to be trying some new ideas as well going forward. And we'll let you know about those as they come. The challenge is after doing a show like this for five years and putting forth a certain kind of personality, which if you know me, I'm not exactly like like I appear on the screen. It's just starting starting to get a little I don't know, humdum, humdrum and dry. And I'd like to see us do something more intentional. So hopefully we'll have that coming your way soon as well. Meanwhile, we got this video review to do for you today. It's about a five minute long video. We're going to try not to take, you know, 30 minutes of your time to get it done. But you might remember this is a YouTube artist speaker that we've reviewed before for his unintentional preaching of the narcissism epidemic as if it were the gospel of Jesus Christ. God bless the man. I don't know him. I, I, I'm sure he's a really nice guy. The intention here is not at all to be mean, but to ask questions about the ideas being presented in the video. And as Lutherans who care about what we believe and why we believe it, ask maybe why this person is being invited to teach our young Lutheran teachers and DCEs to be about what is the church. But again, I'm going to do my best to be a little less snarky than I normally am because I don't want to get the wrong idea. I don't want to make it sound like I'm just attacking, right? What I am is I'm questioning. I'm wondering why this is the method that we're using to come to information. Yeah, as opposed to, eh, I don't know, the Bible. Here we go. I've been talking to a lot of people and everybody has their thoughts. Everybody has their opinions. Everybody has their facts. Everybody has their statistics. And most importantly, everybody has their experiences. All right, so I'm gonna stop there, and I know it's not necessarily fair to not let him say more, but he said a lot so far in that first sentence, and I want you to just get a little media ecology as well. Notice the music in the background. That music is attempting to manipulate you. It's what TV does. It's not a malicious thing, but it is a slightly deceptive thing when music is used to make your brain turn off and assume that something that's being said is actually more, well, prosaic and or beautiful and or true than it really is. It kind of has a way of negating the logical effect of the matter. Now, to be fair, I think you can probably use this kind of tool for good or for evil, but it's just a good thing to know that that music in the background isn't just neutral. Meanwhile, now he's saying that he's going to share some information with you, but I want you to notice the kinds of things that he has lumped together as if they're the same. Opinions and facts. Everyone's got their opinions. Everyone's got their facts. As if somehow this negates the actual validity of all of the above, as if too many people having opinions and there being too many facts has a way of like getting in the way of the actual actual truth. Now, I don't know about this particular gentleman, but I do know that postmodern theory and the postmodern world in which we live actually espouses this reality that there are no actual truths and that everything is coming down to a matter of how you interpret the facts, right? So facts aren't even really facts. They aren't even really true. There is no logical realism. There is only our personal experience of the matter, which you will notice is then the final thing he says that matters. The most important thing everybody's got is their experiences. Now, um, goodness gracious, I think I do have have some empathy for the existentialists and their desire to enjoy life or sort of rise above the moment. But the, your experience, I don't want to hurt you here, right? I'm not, I'm talking to the world right now. Your experience is not the most important thing in the world. It simply is not. Because why? Because you are not the most important thing in the world. What, what matters is God and who God is and what God has said. This will in fact affect your experiences if you believe it to be true. But when it comes to finding out what truth is, what really matters, talking to a lot of people and hearing about their experiences, anecdotal evidence really doesn't matter if we're worried about things like, I don't know, 
truth. So I thought I'd add a little word into the conversation, if I may, and I hope that you'll let me know what you think, whether you agree with me or not, when I ask the question, what is the church really about? All right, so since there is no truth, you're gonna add some of your own perspective in the hope that we would somehow maybe find some truth. Great, and you're asking for my response, so this is it, and I'm really not trying to be mean. I know it's hard to have what you say critiqued. I don't like it when people do it to me, so uh, you know, I get that. But the question, okay, what is the church really about? All right, well, let's, let's figure out what the church is really about. To me, it's not about religion telling you what to do. It's about Jesus teaching you who to be. I'm going to try to let the next couple of parallels that are thrown out continue without interrupting with each one, but I want to show at the start what's going to happen with every one of them. It happened here, it's going to happen in the next couple that follow. Aside from beginning with the idea that we define the church by what to me it means, rather than saying here's what the Bible says about it, you know, Christ who started this church, Jesus who started this church, actually has words to tell us what the church is. Let's set that aside for the second. And notice that we're going to set up a it's not this, it's that reality, but every single it's not this that stated is going to actually be the same thing that you say it's that. You're changing the words to make them sound more malleable or pretty or, or comfortable for you as an individual, but it's the exact same idea. And what's at the root of the exact same idea is every answer you're going to give is law. Every answer you're going to give is about what you're supposed to do for God. And so while on the one hand you're bucking and trying to reject the legalism and the religiosity that you don't like in hypocritical church, which I totally am in agreement with, your answer is actually actually the same legalism. It's just tried to be more nice. And if it weren't a common habit of revivalistic Protestantism to do this over the last 200 years, to diagnose a problem in the church and then go and say, we're going to fix this problem, but to go and reinsert into the problem the answer that caused the problem in the first place, I probably wouldn't get emotional about it. But it's a habit. It's a pattern. It's a tendency to start over again and again and again without actually starting over at all. And it's kind of sad to me because really I totally agree that the church isn't about external hypocritical religion, religion as heartless, cold, you better do it, obey reality. Totally agree. That's not what the church is about. But to say that Jesus is teaching me who to be is to have a religion telling me what to do, as opposed to it being about Jesus telling me who I am because of what he has done for me and you on the cross, right? It's not about Jesus telling you who to be. It's about Jesus telling you what you are and how that's wrong, but how he's fixed it and who you are now in him as a free gift by grace alone, right? That's the gospel, right? And so what you're bucking at is I don't like the law that that's in its legalism destroying what I thought was a healthy spirituality, and so I'm gonna go and fix it, but I am just gonna give more law? No, go and find the actual law gospel. So the root of the next couple of dichotomies is all gonna be a failure to know, and it's not your own fault, because we don't know this by nature, the proper distinction between God's law and his gospel. Both words of truth, but only one of which actually makes the church the church. It's not about religion modifying your behavior, it's about Jesus transforming your heart. It's not about religion shaming you for your past. It's about Jesus redeeming you from it. Ooh, that last one got close, right? It got close, right? He redeemed you from it, yes. But is this gonna mean like somehow that you now are living differently and better and above? Because that's exactly what all the people who created the legalism you don't like in the previous eras tried to do, right? And because it's still turned back inward on the self, it ends up then becoming nothing but a burden and a hammer to those who are brought up and raised in it. As opposed to what you mentioned, this redeeming, it is about Jesus buying you back by the purchase price of his blood. I'd like to hear that mentioned. I haven't seen this whole video yet. I mean, I'm doing this off the cuff, so uh, we'll hope for it, yeah? What is the church really about? It's not about an organization that wants your money. It's about a God that wants your heart. It's not about the church turning a blind eye to the real problems of the world. It's about God trying to open our eyes to the hope that he's bringing into them. It's not about religion forcing you to follow rules, it's about Jesus inviting you to follow him. 
So all along here, while I don't disagree with all of the concerns, because some of them are false things that don't belong in the church, it still is, it's not about law, it's about law. It's not about what you're supposed to do outside of you, it's about what you're supposed to do inside of you, which doesn't make it easier, it actually makes it harder. I still, I mean, I know, I know it's spoken word, it's like trying to be poetic and all, but I'm still waiting for some Bible. It's not about religion freezing you into a mold, it's about allowing Jesus to continually mold and shape and change and work in side of you. It's not about religion molding you. It's about Jesus molding you. And so now again, you got this external versus internal reality as if somehow removing the external requirement of actually the right and wrong law, like don't murder, instead is going to make me somehow become able to more fully complete an internal love law that just is going to transpire from my own heart. Now I'm all for Jesus actually transforming our hearts by the renewing of our minds. But I think that that is all about law and gospel distinction, about not being about what you're supposed to do or how you're supposed to to allow God to do anything, but how God has broken into this world in the person of Jesus Christ to grab you by the hair and yank you out of the muck of your own self-righteousness, which is founded on the belief that you can improve your life in the present. The hope which he has brought is not for this age. There is some certain reality that within the community of believers, we can encourage each other toward the future hope, that we can bear with each other's burdens and forgive each other of the sins that we commit toward each other, our sinfulness as it acts itself out, even though we're fighting against it, but that is still not the reason to be a Christian. The reason to be a Christian, what is the church? The church is the people who have heard about the death and resurrection of Jesus, which he himself has promised is the antidote to death. Yeah, it's so much more than my own little heart feeling better about itself or being nicer, right? It's so much more than me making myself clean in God's eyes. I can't even do that. It's all about Jesus outside of me while I was yet his enemy, dying in my place to make me in his body a friend of God. It's not about religion holding you down. It's about Jesus rising up. It's not about religion being dead. It's about Jesus bringing life. And please don't get me wrong. I think that the church can be a great place. I just think that it's at its best when it's not a place at all, but a people. And that's a really fascinating thing to say. I, I want to hope that when you're saying Jesus rising up, you are confessing his resurrection, but it's kind of hard to tell because we live in an age where people can talk about things like the resurrection as an idea that just makes us feel good. But I'm going to try to put the best construction on this here. You're, you're saying the church is not about you being bogged down with your own self-righteousness, but about Jesus rising from the dead in your place. That's a fantastic thing to say. But then to go on and say, I don't even know what you mean that the church is not a place at all. If you mean not a building, I'm in total agreement with you because the church is not a building. The sanctuary of the building is a place in which church happens because church is the people of God hearing his word and believing it. But then there's also this reality that when Jesus comes to us in his flesh and blood as he promised, and I know we probably disagree about this, but take eat, this is my body, he said it, then this is a place in which the churching of you and me and us together in communion, the definition of community bonded together as one, does take place as a local place. And there's no way to get around that that must happen somewhere. Somewhere. Two or three must gather in his name. So when you say it's a people, this is right, but those people have to be somewhere. And so that makes it also a place. Even though the building, I totally agree, like we idolize our buildings and our little organizations way too much. It's about the builder and the kingdom he's bringing. At the end of the world and in the present right now in his priest word and sacraments. So if that's what you mean, awesome. <sighs> it's not about controlling you. It's about setting you free. Free from what? It's not about puffing you up with facts. It's about encouraging you with faith. Why are facts set against faith? Because the fact of the resurrection, which you, I think you confessed a moment ago, is actually what my faith is in. And that's what encourages me. And so is, is faith merely some spontaneous, feely good idea I have to hope in general? Or is my faith in an object of faith in something else? Is my trust, which is faith in a promise or a set of facts that have been stated by the guy who did rise from the dead? And so again, the dichotomies here are just, well, they're moving forward fast and quick and they're not particularly clear. It's not about hate, it's about hope. It's not about pressure, it's about peace. And it is about righteousness, just not self-righteousness and never at the cost of love.
Agreed. So, so what? What righteousness is about? What? What is it about? Can, can we define the righteousness that is not self righteousness? Because the change in my heart that takes place the moment I look at it and then say, "There, that's righteousness." That's self righteousness, right? The righteousness is outside of us, right? This is where the Lord's Supper becomes such a powerful idea as a reality. Even if you disagree with it, just to think that the righteousness of God in Christ is here being given to you by grace alone as a total and free gift. Now, the fact that the world thinks we're a bunch of haters, that's a problem and we got to deal with that. And the fact that people are teaching the truth in such a way that it makes other people believe they have no love, well, we got to strive not to do that. Although we also have to recognize that the unrepentant sinner is never going to love the truth. Huh? And so it is about facts and faith because facts are what truth is. And that truth, which starts with the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the guy who is the kingdom in himself, who brings the kingdom as the king week in week out in the sacrament of the altar, and who's coming again at the end of time to create the place of an eternal Eden restored, that truth is what our faith and love live from. And without that being at the center of what we define the church to be, we're just going to end up back where we were a generation later complaining about all the hypocrites who are ruining religion. What is the church really about? It's not about some exclusive club. It's about an inclusive family. It's not about pastors getting rich. It's about being rich with grace. It's not about this denomination or that denomination, but putting Christ at the head of everything. Yeah, if we're going to put his word at the head of everything. Like, and this hatred of denominations, I, I get it on the one hand, and yet the history of it uh, is kind of redundant. Like, the people who hate denominations most tend to be those who created more of them. <laughs> like, the Lutherans, I'm a Lutheran, we didn't really want a denomination. We were trying to, like, just stay within the Roman Church, and they kicked us out. But, like, the Protestant world has this history of just dividing and dividing again. So now you have your non-denominations, which are just more denominations. And so when the divisions within these quote-unquote denominations, which are just groups of churches that are trying to work together and figure out what the facts that make them church actually are when those divisions are matters of law and gospel itself so that we actually divide as churches because there are some denying the gospel which we need to live from then it is about this denomination or that denomination not their organization not their voters assemblies but what they teach believe and confess because if we're going to have christ be our head then we have to submit to him in everything that he says in his word which is again why even though i think there's like word behind what you're saying it's wonderful if you'd actually quote christ talking about the church there was a day when Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi and he turned to his chosen apostles, the guys who he was actually going to send to preach, which would create his church. And he asked them, who do people say that the son of man is? Which is to say, who is the Christ? Which is to say, who am I? Because all this while he's basically saying he's the son of man. And some people got wrong answers. They're actually in wrong denominations. Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah. They're outside the bounds of what actual truth, the facts of the matter are. And so their faith is misplaced. But Simon Peter replies, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus gets excited. He's like, Rock on, Peter. Blessed are you. You only know this because God in heaven has actually revealed it to you by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has transformed your heart to actually recognize who I am because you couldn't do it by yourself. You could not allow me to be who I am. You have to be destroyed and raised again by me, and that's happened. And I tell you, Peter, little rock in the Greek, that on this rock, big rock in the Greek, not the Pope, as the Catholics would generally say with this text, but the big rock in the Greek, this confession you just made, which can't be made by sinful man, but you're making by the power of the Holy Spirit who has preached it into your heart. On this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against this fact that I am the Son of Man, the Christ, the living God in the flesh, so that when you kill me, I won't be able to stay dead. It's pretty much an impossible thing. And that I'm going to bind you to myself so that you can't stay dead either. And I will give to you, Peter, singular here, plural later in the same book, the keys of the kingdom, the ability to loose sins and retain sins. And whatever you bind here with the law will remain bound in heaven, but whatever you loose here with the gospel will be loosed in heaven. So that you're absolutely right. Christ is the head of the church and that's the entire point, but it's all then not about some idea, but about the real man and his very real words, particularly the words, I forgive you. So that in Matthew 28, after he had completed this destruction of Hades, of death and the powers of hell and had risen from the dead, he commissions his 12 apostles, now 11, but eventually with Paul to be more, to go into the entire world and build the church with the power he has given them, which is nothing but what he says here. As you go, he says, disciple is an imperative word in the Greek. Disciple all the nations, everyone who you come across. How? By baptizing them into me, by washing them with water into my name, which Jesus implies here actually has 
and effect of disciple making. Baptize, here he says to make disciples, baptize them and teaching them to observe. Teretain in the Greek, which means to cherish, to hold tight to, to guard everything that I have commanded you. All of the rules and the truths and the facts which I, Jesus, the Lord of heaven and earth, have actually said are and will remain true. That heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or tittle of these words will pass away. And what concerns me about the manner of the delivery of the video is that you're treating it like that idea that there's this final truth is in the way of Christianity. And it's not. And you know it's not because you're actually trying to promote some kind of truth at the same time. But the postmodern, narcissistic, opinion driving rejection of outside of you authority that is the eternal church of Christ, which is his body, which is the people that trust his words based on the power of his words, the rejection of that is the rejection of all of it. Yeah. And even though I'm not saying you have, I'm saying that people who are listening to this are maybe going to get led astray by that. And it's not about wearing the right clothes on Sunday morning. It's about clothing ourselves in his presence. Uh, agreed. What's the deal? Like, where, where is these churches that make everybody have to wear the right clothes? I, I still haven't found one. I got people wearing jeans. I got people in suits. I got people drinking coffee in the pews. And while it may not be the most reverent way to recognize the presence of God in their midst, it's like, I, I'm not going after who, where are these churches? And maybe you're living in a different experience than I am. But if it is about clothing ourselves in the quote unquote presence of God, I got to ask, what's that? Where's the presence? Take, eat. Absolutely. Eat, drink. I, I have the presence of God. I've received the white robe of righteousness. But is that, I'm not sure that's what you're talking about. And it's not even about Sunday morning in the first place. It's about every single day kind of disagree in that Sunday morning in the first place is when Jesus rose from the dead and that's why it's about that day but it is true that like that doesn't make Sunday more holy than any other day but that every day by faith we walk in the words of God so I get that but I again I'm wondering do you realize how little you are actually making any distinctions at all but are sort of just saying it's not about one day being self-righteous it's about every day being self-righteous and, and you don't mean to say that because you're against self-righteousness but you haven't replaced it with gospel with any clear way yet at best you've mishmashed some long gospel together so that there's this redemption that you're talking about but the redemption is still you living a better life eh? and it's not like the protestant world doesn't do this on a regular basis it's about all that the protestant world is capable of doing now granted there's a couple of calvinists out there who get long gospel it, forgive me guys i'm not l lumping you in with everybody else you get mad when i do that but generally speaking the protestant world just can't see that there are these two different truths two different facts which god has revealed and that they're both good the law is good trying to do the right thing for your neighbor in love is good but that what makes us different is one day the day of the lord which was the day of his cross which was also connected to the three days later day of his resurrection both of which bring us the day that's coming right the day of judgment where what you've done will be judged will be laid bare in its entirety and yet if you are under and behind christ clothed in the righteousness of his body and blood not a spiritual happy presence but his actual humanity that judgment can't touch you why aren't we preaching that more because the church is not about proving yourself it's about accepting the one who's already been proved you mean Jesus, right? Who's proven himself by rising from the, from the dead. Um, it's not about proving myself by doing this one thing. It's about proving myself by accepting this other thing. As opposed to, I'm going to give you the gospel way to say it. It's not about proving yourself. It's about the fact that Christ has proven himself in your life. Place. It's not that you aren't trying to get there, but there's a clarity problem. It's like the gospel's been muffled by not being able to distinguish it from you. It's not about justifying your behavior. It's about surrendering to the one who has already justified you. False dichotomy. Law, law. It's not about justifying yourself. It's about justifying yourself by an action that puts you under the one who justified you, but you still got to do it, right? It's not about your surrender. You don't have to surrender. You will surrender. That's a fact. Don't get me wrong. But why not just say it's not about justifying yourself. It's about that Christ has justified you. That's the gospel. And you keep wanting to slip a little law right underneath it, which is a mask that keeps the conscience from truly being set free, which is the thing that's causing your angst in the first place. It's not about doing more right than wrong. It's about knowing the one who is good. Yes. Mostly. How? By his words that don't change. It's not about the controversy we can stir up. It's about the love that came down like that one. That's good. Although I don't know who's actually trying to stir up controversy. Like it's a false law in that sense. I don't know who's out there trying to be mean on purpose, but you're right. It's not about us rising up in ourselves, but about the one who came down. It's a nice twist. It's not about getting all your questions answered. Yeah, it is. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, Jesus has truth. It's called doctrine. It's wonderful stuff. Uh, let me see what your dichotomy is. Though. It's about the freedom we have to ask the questions in the first place. Well, we definitely have freedom to ask questions of the scriptures, and the scriptures gives us answers, but I don't know that it's about that. But there is a good thing to be able to not be afraid of asking and not knowing, and to know that the word of eternal truth is there to give answers. Strange dichotomy, though. I'm not sure what you're getting at. Back to this, like, there is no truth kind of thing? I mean, you're right on the edge of it, and that's what's scary. And if you haven't studied the postmodern world and postmodern philosophy, like philosophy, you're not going to understand what I'm saying. Go study this stuff. It totally tells us where we are in the world, the days of present darkness and evil that are around us, the strongholds of the enemy, their ideas, yeah? And they're slippery. Uh, here's a nice book. It's got pretty pictures in it, which is why I like it. It's all about the art history of the world showing the decline of Western civilization into this age of anti-truth. And if you can't understand the language of the age of anti-truth, you might just borrow it without realizing it. And the problem is your context does define your words just a little bit so that when you're using the words of the anti-context, anti-truth philosophy to preach your truth, you're undermining the very thing you're trying to do. Yeah. And that's what I'm worried about. And it's about the God who is always listening. What is the church really about? It's not about proving your point. It's about pointing to a savior. Yes, good, true. But I don't know that saying it's not about proving your point helps point to a savior because if I'm pointing to the savior, I still am making a point. And that's where the anti-truth undercurrent here is hurting the thing you're trying to do. And I like the twist. I like the pun, the use of the word, right? I can respect that as a writer. And I can respect the, the problem when people believe that doctrine is for its own sake rather than for the sake of the hearer who is to believe it and be set free by it. But at the end of the day, pointing to the savior is proving the point that you are saved. The gospel is the ultimate point from God and we can't reject all ideas and still hold on to that one. What do you think? Do you really wanna know if I actually disagree? Or am I just stirring up controversy and creating denominations? Am I failing to love because I believe in truth? And that's the other thing that's scary about the way the tolerant philosophy that doesn't tolerate truth is embedding itself under everything in our culture, including our churches. It's because it comes and it says, what do you think? But then when what you think is what scripture says rather than what the world tells you to believe, the world isn't so ready to listen. And I think that using the music to make you feel like my point made more sense would be just dishonest. And so um, I think that too. Hey, thanks for tuning in to Worldview Everlasting. I'm hoping you love the changes that are coming your way. Make sure you check out, of course, Around the Word Devotions and the theworldviewerlasting.com where we got other pastors answering your questions. If you waited all the way to the end, God bless you. You're the true fans. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, rock on. Squirrel.